Have you ever wondered why some people live a seemingly limitless life while other people seem to live a life filled with limitations? Well, I submit to you that limitless life or life of limitations is a choice that you get to make. In fact, it's a decision you get to make. And you're going to find out why there's a difference between a choice and a decision, but you're also going to find out why the people who live a seemingly limitless life live a seemingly limitless, limitless life. It seems like the people who are the best of the best are so far in a way ahead of everybody else that people feel like they're never going to catch up. So you think about somebody like Tiger Woods in his heyday, right? When he went to a golf tournament, everybody expected him to win. He was number one in the world for, I don't even remember, 150-something weeks in a row, which is more than three years in a row. He was number one in the world. Nobody else has ever even come close to that. But he was so far and away, people just decided, his, his opposition, his competition decided if he was playing, that he was going to win. Which means he decided that for them. When Michael Jordan was in the league, like, like he did stuff that nobody ever thought about doing before. And so the question is, like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna play basketball like Michael Jordan. I'm not gonna play golf like Tiger Woods, but I wasn't put here to play basketball like Michael Jordan, and I wasn't put here to play golf like Tiger Woods. But I was put here to be the king of my thing. And and you were put here to be the king of your thing. Or ladies, you were put here to be the queen of your scene. And you can be the best of the best. Forget about the rest. There's no such thing as competition. You can live a limitless life if you learn to believe more in your leverage than you do in your limitations. And most people believe more in their limitations than they do in their leverage. And so what they do is they go around proving to themselves that all the stuff they thought they couldn't do, they were right about it. There's a different way to live your life. Now, I... When I think of what's possible for me, I pretty much think everything that's a part of my thing is possible for me. And the only thing that's impossible for me is that something that I'm supposed to do would be impossible for me. And if you'd learned that's a disciplined way of thinking that most people don't have. Like the, the biggest key to success is not a morning routine. The biggest key to success is not, well, you have to wake up at 5.30 every morning. Well, I don't wake up at 5.30 every morning. Now, and in fact... In fact, there are some mornings when I wake up at 5.30, but for the most part, that's not most mornings, right? You know when I wake up? Usually when I'm done sleeping, right? So that like, you, well, you have to do this and you have to exercise in the morning and you have to drink a cup of coffee in the morning and you got to work out and you can't look at your cell phone. Like all, all that's great. I mean, you can set your environment up in a way that you're more likely to win, but the reality is you have to make a decision and then you have to learn how to understand the difference between a choice and a decision. Because here's what's not going to happen. You're not going to achieve anything in your life without confidence. What is confidence? Well, the word confidence, the root word of the word confidence is what? Confide. And what does the word confide mean? It means to trust. And so when a person doesn't have confidence, what it means is they don't trust themselves. Why don't you trust yourself? Like, why don't you have confidence? Why do you believe that if somebody else did it, it would work? But if you did, it's not going to work. Is that a good question, my people? Talk to me, my people. Talk to me. So that's a good question. So, so we don't want to, like, I don't want to go through life looking, well, yeah, of course they can do it, but not me. No, but of course I, now I don't know if anybody else can do it or not, but I know I can get the deal done. Right? Put me in the arena where the, where the battles are being fought. Where the, where, the, where, the, where the awards are being won. It's so interesting. Like I talked about David a couple of weeks ago, right? David, and, um, talking about the story of David and Goliath. And one of the things I didn't cover in the story was like when David came down and uh, Goliath, David came down to bring food to his brothers. And he came down to, uh, he came down and he heard the giant. And then David, before he decided to fight Goliath, he negotiated, renegotiated, and renegotiated again his contract. Because he said, what shall be done to the man that slayeth, this, that, that killeth this Philistine? Well, he's going to get the king's daughter as his wife. I'm going to be the son-in-law to the king. Okay, that's a good start. What else? Well, he's also going to, he's going to be his son-in-law uh, to the king. He's also going to, the king's going to enrich him with great riches. And then his family will be tax-free in Israel. Just give me the last one. I don't, I, don't, I don't need the king's daughter. I don't need just that tax free one. That's the one I'm looking for right there. Right. And so and so so after Dave, they told him that he literally turned to somebody else and said, what's going to be done? 
and then somebody else answered him after the same man. Then he turned to somebody else and said, now, I, was, I want to make sure before I go fight this guy, I want to know how much my check is going to be. And see, one of the problems is, one of the problems, we think, we think that not charging for the results that we produce in our environment is somehow being humble. It's not being humble. It's just not being very smart. David said, I want to know. Yeah, I'm going to kill the giant anyway. But since I'm going to kill him anyway, I want to know how much I'm going to get paid. And he confirmed it twice after he heard it. Why? Because in the, in the Hebrew culture, the, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So now he's like, okay, I got my contract. Now I got my marching orders. And see, one of the problems, like you don't, people, people talk about count the cost. Yeah, count the cost, but also count the commissions. Like how much am I going to get paid? People ask me all the time, man, like how do I know how much to charge for producing a result for a client. My answer is always the same. You always start with this. Is it a price that makes you smile? If it's not a price that makes you smile, it's too low. Now, now see, here's what your problem is. You thought it was supposed to be a price to make your customer smile. They can smile or don't smile. <laughs> they should be smiling because I'm getting ready to help you. Right? Right? But, but if, you're gonna, if I'm going to do it, you're going to have to make it worth my while. Otherwise, I ain't interested. I got a call from a guy recently, and he wanted me to speak virtually or live at a conference with thousands of people. He says, so how can we make this work? I said, well, you, pay for, if I, you want me to be there like physically? You pay for my air travel. It's 11000 an hour. Um, and I know, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, you're just, oh, whatever. Okay, do you. Okay, that's mine. I, and I'm okay not speaking too. Okay, so let's start there. I'm okay with that's too much for us. I'm okay with that. It's 11,000 an hour for me to get there. It was in Las Vegas. From Tampa to Las Vegas, 11,000 an hour there and back. Whatever that is, let's call it five hours there, five hours back. So that's 110 grand just for travel. That doesn't include my room because you're going to need to get me a room. And my speaking fee is $250,000 an hour. So I'll come speak. You pay me two fifty. dollars Pay for my travel. I'll happily come speak on your stage. Oh, well, it's a big stage. We just wanted to give somebody exposure. Well, you can give somebody else exposure. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I got all the exposure I need. I'm good. Now, I'm not saying everybody's prices need to be that high, but see, what a lot of people don't realize, like people think, oh, your prices are just that high because you think you're all that in a bag of chips. No, no, because time is something that I have less and less of every day, and I value my time whether you value it or not. And by the way, you're never going to value my time if I don't value my time. Right, so, so a lot of you are frustrated because you want your clients to put a higher value on your time than you do. Can I get a witness? But I'm not doing that. I, it is what it is. It costs what it costs, right? So what does that mean? Well, um, like I set my prices. I remember when I used to do coaching for $5,000 an hour and I was coaching this guy, really high level entrepreneur, like really high level entrepreneur. Um, in fact, well, just really high, like tens of millions of dollars a year got kind of a person. And I was coaching him, he's like, and he made a lot of money based on some coaching I gave him. He's like, okay, I want to pay you to teach me how to tell stories. How much do you charge per hour for coaching? I said $5,000 an hour. He said, good, I just sent you $40,000, I want eight hours. <sighs> I got eight hours? So, and he's a good dude, I mean, I like him, but I didn't want to... Eight hours now, forty thousand dollars. Eight hours. I'm like, now I got to do do this. Talk to him for an hour every week. Now I know, I know, I know. That's, I know to, this, this sounds crazy, but I'm I'm just I'm just telling you, my time is more and more limited as I get older. I'm 61 years old. That means, like, if I'm going to live for 20 more years and I go on three vacations a year, like, I don't have 20 more years of vacation. I only have 60 more vacations, right? Like, so like I look at everything based on the diminishing return. So I'm like. And literally, as soon as we got off that Zoom, I raised my speaking fee, to, I mean, my coaching fee to 25000 an hour. And then, like, doing coach 25000 an hour, sold a bunch of VIP days, eight hours, 200 grand. I'm like, I, no, it's too much. Right? And so, uh, by the way, I, I'm, I'm showing you my thought process. Watch this. Tony Robbins said, and I think he's right. I don't think he's right about everything. I think he's right about this. He said, if you want to, if you want to um, duplicate any form of human excellence, you need to find somebody 
who's performing at a high level in that discipline and model three things. He said, number one, you want to model their belief systems. I submit to you that the life you're living right now is a direct result of the beliefs that you hold right now. Beliefs that you hold about the past and beliefs that you hold about the future. So he said the second thing, you need to first thing, model their belief system. Second thing, you model their physiology. You carry yourself the way they carry themselves. Like if, if I came in here and I was like this, you would assume something about me. If I talk like this, you would assume something about me. If I was shifty-eyed, this is my physiology. And I never looked at anybody. If I never looked anybody in the face, <laughs> you would think, this person can't be trusted. Right? So you model their physiology. And then you model their mental syntax. And the mental syntax is the order in which they fire off messages in their brain. For instance, if you say, the dog bit Johnny, that has meaning, right? The dog bit Johnny. But if you say, Johnny bit the dog, that has a different meaning, even though both sentences have the exact same words in them. So what, like, like the order that you do a thing oftentimes is as important as the thing you're doing. Are y'all tracking? Okay. So, so you have to have confidence. Why don't people have confidence? People don't have confidence because they don't trust themselves. Why don't people trust themselves? Because the only person who's heard every lie you've ever told is you. Watch this. Here's the main reason. You told yourself, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Like, this is, why, this is why New Year's resolutions are a bad idea. You say, this year I'm going to blah, blah, blah. And then three weeks in, you stop doing it. Right? Because, and the reason you stopped doing it is because you made a choice. You didn't make a decision. I'm going to show you what that means in a minute. And so what happened is you, ha you, have, this, you have this wishy-washy way of being and so you don't have confidence because you've broken your word to yourself so many times in the past, you can't believe a word you say. How many of y'all tracking? And so confidence comes from the root word confide. What if, what if confidence was you just learn how to confide in... Uh, you, have, you confide in self. You have confidence in yourself because you trust yourself because you know your word is your bond. How many of y'all tracking? Here's what happens. Like, if you don't trust yourself because you've broken your word to yourself so many times in the past, you can't believe a word you say, when you're talking to people, what you don't realize is people don't see you through their eyes. They see you through your eyes. And you're literally causing people to doubt you because you doubt yourself. How many of y'all tracking? Wave at me, my peeps. Right? And so, so what happens is the word, the word confide, the root, uh, the prefix con, con, uh, con uh, confide um, means with. Right? So with fidelity. Fi fidel. With fidelity. With, with is what? With fidelity. What's fidelity? It's just like truth. Like you're 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 doing the thing. You t you take the word, you take the word. Decide. De. Side. What's decide mean? De of, or from. Side, to cut. When you make a decision, you cut yourself off from any other possibility. Somebody said so. You got, and they and they thought they were being clever but they were actually being clueless. They said, they said, you got three birds sitting on the fence. Two, to fly, two decide to fly away. How many are left? And somebody said, well, one's left. And he said, no, three are left because the other two decided they didn't fly away. No, if they actually decided, they would have flown away because they cut themselves off from not flying away. Now, if he said two, three birds are sitting on a fence and two choose to fly away, how many are left? Well, now three are left. Because a choice means, the word choose just means pick one. If I'm picking one today, I can pick a different tomorrow. And what happens is people go around picking one that feels the most comfortable in the moment, that feels the easiest path in the moment. You can't, you can't live a limitless life like that. People who go out and change the world, they literally have a, dis a reality distortion field that is so big that it doesn't matter that other people tell them it's impossible. 
David, David's brother said, oh, what are you doing down here? You just came down to see the battle. We know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Like, y'all hiding. I'm going to go fight this dude. Why are you fussing at me? I ain't the problem. He's the problem. Y'all the problem. I ain't the problem. But see what happens for people who are unwilling to change a situation the people who are willing to change the situation are the problem to those people because now you got to live with yourself after you see that your next door neighbor go do the thing that you've been talking about doing for the last 10 years. Can I get a witness? And most people don't make decisions. They make choices. But you, you, if you're going to be a person of honor, you need to learn to make, make decisions because to decide is to make a covenant with yourself. Remember the word covenant, right? So two people come together, they would kill an animal, they would walk in a circle, they would cut their, they would take a knife in their left hand, cut their right hand, put their hands together, bind it together with a rope. The word covenant means to cut. And they would make a promise on their life saying, if I don't keep my word to you, may what happened to this animal happen to me. What if your word, the things you say, became a covenant that you make with yourself? So now you can trust yourself. Because you'd rather die in honor keeping your word than live in dishonor and not keep your word. Like, the game would change for you forever. Because now you don't go through life sticking your toe in the water that could elevate your ship and take you to a place you've only dreamed of in the past. You don't stick your toe in that water anymore. You dive in the water. And then you start building your ship after you're in the water. You figure it out on the way. And so, if you're going to have a limitless life, the first thing you need to do is you need to have, like, you need to have a very determined and clear focus. Now, by the way, everybody focuses. So here's the difference between people who succeed and people who fail. People who succeed, so success goes on this path. People who succeed... They focus on intention, which means I, me, I decided in my autonomy what I'm going to focus on. I didn't have somebody else decide that for me. I didn't have, like, I don't go to the restaurant and I say, hey, uh, they say, what would you like to order? I don't know. Tell me what's good. No, I already know. When I go to the restaurant, I bring my appetite with me, and I know what I want to eat, and I don't want the server telling me what they like, because I might not like this. I mean, there are people who like stuff I don't like. There are people who like lima beans. She might like lima beans. And then she might say, the lima beans are great. There's no, I don't care how great the lima beans are. I don't want the lima beans. <laughs> so, but people who fail, they're focused. But guess what they focus on? They focus on distractions. Literally. Literally, the difference between success and failure is people who succeed focus on intention. People who fail focus on distraction. And what's really interesting is it doesn't matter in which direction they look. They're still focused on the same thing. A person who succeeds, they look back to the past. Guess what they see? They see intention. Oh, that thing happened to me to get me ready for the thing I'm now doing. That thing happened to me to get me ready for the thing I'm going to do. So I'm not a victim I am not a victim of the thing that happened in the past. I am a product of the thing that happened in the past. So now, so, so I just, I just uh, finished this book yesterday. I've, I've been like going, so I, I was at this mastermind in, my, in uh, Mexico. And the, a guy speaking there, his name is Dr. Benjamin Hardy. and He's the co-author of Who Not How um, with, da with Dan Sullivan. And so Who Not How is a book that basically the premise of that book is like if you're focused on if you're if you're focused on trying to figure out how to do the thing that's missing in your business in your life and your whatever you're focused on the wrong thing you shouldn't be focused on the how you should be focused on the who so so a lot of people are focused on how do i sell more of my stuff before you do that as an entrepreneur like time out why don't you figure out who you should be selling to in the first place like the who for like who should i be selling to is way more important than how do i sell because the who you're selling to is going to determine how you sell, right? But most people never, like, and, and, and believe it or not, <clears throat> coaching thousands of entrepreneurs, the hardest thing for them to decide is who they're going to help and how they're going to help them. How do you have a business? Like, you have to know that. You have to know who you can help. You have to know how you can help them. If you don't know those two things, like, you're just, you're a wandering generality. 
<laughs> Trudy, you're funny. <laughs> so, so, so you need to have focus. So you need to focus on figuring out how to turn everything in your past into a positive catalyst for your current life, for your current experience of life. So what does that mean? That means you have to look at everything that's happened in the past and realize that none of it happened to you and all of it happened for you. It's so fascinating to me when I read the story of Joseph because the story of Joseph affected Joseph negatively. It affected his father negatively. And the same experience when Pharaoh asked, jo <clears throat> asked Israel, he said, so how old are you? Or Jacob asked Jacob, how old are you? He said, um, um, few and, not, he didn't use the word terrible. He said, few and miserable or something like that have been the days of my life. Really? Really? That's few and miserable? Really have been the days of your life? You got a beautiful family? Yeah, I, I get it. You, your, your boys, your brother tried to kill you. I get all that. But f like you're, you're putting the wrong frame around it. Frames create focus. Do you understand? You can't change what happened to you in the past, but you have every ability whatsoever to change what it means to you. You can decide right now. I used to think, well, I'm going to use myself as an example. Not that I really thought this, but I'm going to use it as an example so you can understand it. Like I've got six brothers. They can all run. I had polio. I've got this brace on my leg. I can't run. I used to think, I didn't think this, but I'm just using it as an example. I used to think, well, God doesn't love me as much as he loved them because they could run and I couldn't run. Or I could think, well, God loved me more than he loved them. That's a, because he made it so I couldn't run, so I learned how to fight, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I, could, that, I mean, that could be it, right? Or I could just say, watch this. Why, like, I, I'm, I'm deciding the frame. I could say, look, God ordained in his sovereign, I'm not saying God did this to me, but he ordained this for my life in his sovereign will before eternity ever began because God knew in order for my brain to speed up as fast as it needed to speed up for my assignment, my body needed to slow down. Right? Like where, where do the meanings come from that you have on the situations in your life? You know where they come from? Like, well, you decide. You decide where they come from. Joseph said about the very same things, the, the very same things, except maybe the stuff that happened to Joseph was worse than the stuff that happened to Jacob. Because his brothers, his own brothers, his, oh, his big brothers, they wanted to kill him. They threw him in a pit and left him there. And then some Midianites came and took him out, and then they sold him into slavery. Like, and then he's doing a good job at Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife lies on him. He goes to prison for a crime he didn't commit. Like, like what would your attitude be? When I get out of here, I'm going to show everybody, right? Not him. Joseph just made sure wherever he was, he honored God to the best of his ability and did the best he could with every situation. And guess what happened? Here's Joseph's testimony of those, that's those same experiences. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Do you understand? If there is no affliction, there can be no fruitfulness. There is no strength without struggle. There's no, there's no advancement without adversity. There's no destiny without difficulty. We got to go through something to get to something. But in order for us to go through what we were designed to get through, we have to look at the past and assign a different meaning to it. We have to focus on how it helped us. Yes, it was painful, but it helped us. It set us up for where we are right now and where we're headed in the future. So when I look at the past, I use it as a catalyst to, to, to propel me into my bright future. As the reason, as instead of the reasons why I'm stuck in this terrible present. First of all, the present isn't terrible. Why? Because unto him that is joined to all living, there is hope, and a living dog is better than a dead lion. That's what the scripture says. A dead lion can't even roar. So, so we have to have focus. We have to have focus, but focus by itself is not enough. We, and by the way, let me talk about. Let me say, let me say this about focus. What our focus on the future, our focus on the future determines our actions in the present. So I'm going to tell you something now. I'm going to tell you something. If you live mostly focused on the past and trying to keep things the way they were, you are, you are literally performing an exercise in futility because the only constant in life is change. 
So how can my life get better because of the change? And how can I take advantage of the change instead of me fighting to try to keep things from changing? Are y'all tracking? Now, when I look to the future, I have to make sure that, like, first of all, when I look at the future, am I seeing something that's real? Or am I just, like, do I get to see something that's there? Or am I just seeing it in the, in the eyes of my imagination? Where am I looking at the future? I'm looking at it in my mind, which means I'm the only person who determines what the future looks like to me. Are y'all tracking? Because I made it up. I made it up. Anything I tell myself about a future outcome, I made it up. Well, if I'm going to make up outcomes about the future, it stands to reason that I might as well make up outcomes that serve me and empower me instead of making up outcomes that di disempower me and don't serve me. Because I'm making it up. I'm making it up. I mean, I, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to build a $100 million business. Okay, but I made that up. I, I could never make $100 million. That's a, I made that up. Do you understand we're making it up as we go? You might as well make up something that inspires you, that challenges you, that charges you, that energizes you so that you can move in that direction. It's so fascinating. It's so fascinating. By the way, this is, a, this is, this is biblical mind psychology. Like I'm not, I'm not like that's, it's in the Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. That's one of the most redundant verses in scripture. Re means to do again. So it says rejoice again, have joy in the Lord when always. And again, I say rejoice, or and again, I say again, have joy. Why is he telling us to have joy? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. When we have joy, we have strength. When we have sorrow and depression and sadness, and we're focused on all the things that are missing in our lives, we have discontentment and a lack of gratitude. And that discontentment and lack of gratitude, it doesn't get us more of what we desire. It causes us to lose the things we already have. When Adam and Eve focused on what was missing, they lost all the abundance that they had. The same thing is true today that was true back then. Well, anyway, so, so here's what it says, though. Here's what it says in, so it says, uh, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men for the Lord is hand. So it's saying be joyful, but then it's saying be willful. Let your moderation, what's moderation? Self-control. Let it be known unto all men. So how do I do that? Well, the Lord is at hand. The thing that we're supposed to use our willpower for is not to make ourselves do something. The thing we should use our willpower for is to remind ourselves that the Lord is present. Because when I use my willpower to remind myself that the Lord is present, then I have joy. Why? In his presence is fullness of joy. Why? Now I'm empowered. Why? Because I know who I am based on whose I am. Because when I'm with him, he shows me who I am. Because my identity comes from him. I don't, I, don't, I'm not, I don't have the identity of the world. I don't have the identity of Myron. I have the identity of God. I am who he knows I am. How many of y'all tracking? So what we want to do is we're going to make sure that we're operating from that place where when I'm looking at the future, I'm, I'm drawing on a future that's empowering me. Wrap your mind around this. Focus on the future. Focus on a future outcome that empowers you. And that will give you strength. How do you know that focusing on a future outcome that you desire empowers you in the present? Because it says it in Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. By the way, that's not talking about people up in heaven watching us. It's talking about their testimony to us about, of the benefits of having faith, whether we experience the benefits of that faith in this life or whether we don't, because it says some die, having died in faith, not having received the promise, right? So we know that everybody, having faith, faith does what faith does. Faith makes my life better. It doesn't always make my circumstance better. Just know that, Okay. And we've all believed for somebody being healed and that person wasn't healed. We've all believed that somebody was going to like be healed and they died. We, we've all had that experience. Why? Because it is a point under man wants to die and after this is judgment. God is sovereign. And there's no prayer I'm going to pray opposing the will of God and it's going to be answered with a yes. Okay, so just, just understand, understand that. So, so um, when I look to the future, wherefore we're seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Guess what that word weight means? It means burden. So I'm supposed to put down every burden and what? Lay it aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset me. What's the sin that does so easily beset me? The sin of doubt. Because the whole chapter leading up to that was talking about faith. So the sin that so easily besets me is the sin of doubt. Beset means to stop. So the sin that stops me is doubt. And then it says, so how do I do that? How do I put down the weights? How do I lay aside the sin that does so easily beset me? I do it like this. Looking unto Jesus, that's what it says next, right? the author and finisher of our faith. Now, that's not the key in that passage. You want to know the key in that passage? Looking unto Jesus, author and finisher of our faith, here's the key. Who for the joy that was what? Set before him. That gave him the ability to endure the cross of his present, despising the shame, and is now set down on the right hand of the throne of God. 
So Jesus himself, the scripture says, he focused on the joyful anticipation of the outcome he desired more than the current pain of the present circumstances. And when I learn to intentionally focus on the joyful anticipation of the outcome I desire instead of the anxious apprehension of the outcome I don't desire, then I have the power to endure. So focus, I'm going to give you the other two. I'm not, I don't have time to go into them right now. Faith and follow through. So faith is not, see, one of, one of the reasons your faith is so wavering because you have faith in faith. You need to stop having faith in faith and start having faith in the one who is faithful. You need to start having faith in the God who cannot lie and then operate as if everything he told you is truth. Not just true, but truth. There's a difference between what's true and what's truth. What's true is um, Myron's in Tampa. That's true, but it's not truth. Because later this month, I'll be in Orlando. I'll no longer be in Tampa. What's truth cannot change. So God cannot lie. And if he said something, it is what it is. And so here's what I'm going to end on. Here's what God told me in his word. He didn't whisper it in my ear. It was in the book. Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the same See, nor stand, blessed the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, in his law, in his principles, in his promises, in his precepts, in his practices, in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Prosperity is a Bible word. It comes straight from God, and I love prosperity. God is a God of abundance. If you want to know God's original design for wealth, you need to check out that video I did on why evil people are rich. Video title, God's original design for wealth. Hope this blesses you. Stay blessed by the best. In the meantime, in between time, peace out, Cub Scouts.